that pattern or to create an opposite situation. Either way, we are profoundly affected by the attitudes and actions of our families. So, in talking about the past, first there's, we want to talk about the positive aspects of the past. Um, as you were looking at the diagrams and we were talking about, you know, when you're a child and you're in the, inside the circle and teen as you're moving away and, and so on, we hope that you recognize portions of your life where you, you were there. And hopefully you were able to look at that and you, were, you could see, even in the worst scenario, you were able to see some good, something good about your upbringing. And, and you know, there's probably, I, I'm kind of stressing if it was the worst case scenario, but, you know, if you had a great upbringing, you know, think of all those good times. And uh, think of those times that you, you can recall expressions of love or encouragement from your parents and how they gave, maybe, maybe they made you have a strong sense of, you know, in my, with my relationship with my dad, a strong sense of a, a work ethic, that this was something that was really important to you. There's something good, no matter what, in any situation about your upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to take time to be grateful for those things, whatever they may be. If it was a perfect childhood, then be grateful for that. If it was a rough one, look for those things, however minute they may seem, to be grateful for. Um, there's also, um, you know, that was the positive, then there's the neutral. Um, some issues just may have been your family's way of doing things. But it, better or worse, it really doesn't matter. It's just what you would think, due to your upbringing, is the right way to do things. Um, some couples may probably, when they first got married, probably notice this at the holidays, that way of doing things, just your family's way. I know you're chomping at the bit. Such as opening presents on Christmas Eve mm -hmm. or Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. Christmas. <laughs> or the menu. This one was huge. We, as a planning family, had a great spread of food that we could eat all day long. And eat. And then we and planned eat. for leftovers <laughs> so we could eat the leftovers the next day. But his family had like a turkey and potatoes. Maybe there was gravy, maybe not. It would depend on what mood his mom was in. And so that was a big one. The menu was a big one for and us. This one really falls more for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Football games or board games with the family. No. No. Okay. <laughs> Those are some things that will probably come up this, this year as well during mm -hmm. Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yep. Um... Or maybe on the neutral side of things, it's just how your parents' marriage was run. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't take us long to realize that Kim's mode was to have, as we've gone over already, everything planned. Everything. And I, coming from my upbringing, I was like, whoa, just relax. <laughs> take a Chill second, out. sit down. But I, it took me a long time to realize that this was how Kim relaxed. If everything was, if she was planning it, and in her head she was confident this was going to work out, that's what made her feel relaxed. Not sitting in front of the TV watching the football game like it was for me. I, I have lots of faith, but I still like things to be planned. One of the biggest things that were, for us was vacation, family vacations. So I would like plan everything. We planned a trip to San Diego, and I would, um, what is it, MapQuest, like, to, to the hotel, to the hotel from SeaWorld. From SeaWorld to the hotel, it was bad. Like folders of stuff. And it kind of turned, turned out yucky because everything was planned. And then when we went to Portland this last time, we, we didn't plan anything. We didn't get any hotels. That was bad. So after 12 years, we're finally learning maybe if we combine the two, yeah. it would work out better. That's, I, I thought you were going to brag on the trip to Oregon. I was like, holy smokes, that was a headache because we, we didn't plan anything at all. So, so now he appreciates yeah, we're trying map to find, quest. We, I do appreciate a map quest. <laughs> I don't have to stop and ask or feel pressured to stop to ask. Oh, that's, that's, that's what it is. He doesn't have to ask for directions. Now you get the rough portion. <laughs> then there's the negative. Our upbringing will have taught us some things that will have negative effects on our marriage. This may be the case if we had a poor role model of marriage. Um, maybe there was a lack of communication between our parents, or there were emotions that never were, were revealed, or their conflicts weren't resolved in a healthy way. If we have not seen how our parents' behavior influenced us, we can find ourselves replicating it in our own marriages. Where you come from and family history lies about beneath about every issue that you'll face. More stories. <clears throat> it's on. How come you keep turning that off? I got a drink. Um, 
one of the issues that we faced when Kim and I got married was that, you know, not just the planning thing, but uh, my family was a family of hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. uh, big time hedgehogs. And Kim, big time rhinos. Big time rhinos, <laughs> and yeah. So when we had a disagreement, okay, back then we have had a fight. That's yeah, all it was to it. Right. I wanted to do a hedgehog. I wanted to walk away. I wanted to go outside, get some air, and leave her fuming. And she, <laughs> she wanted to fight about it. She wanted it. to duke it out. She wanted to, I mean, if we would have had boxing gloves, I'm sure she would have taken them off. I but, haven't asked um, for Christmas, I think, a couple of years. I Boxing knew you just take them great. off. But we need to learn how to resolve the, those conflicts. You know, Todd and Candace talked about resolving conflict. And, and Kim and I have worked through that and still do at times. And it's, it's good. I mean, we're just knowing the difference, looking at my family and right. her family was such a big thing for us to go, whoa, that, that's how come we're dealing with it this makes, part of it. It starts to make it. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can communicate it. So if, another thing is if our parents split up, we may carry a fear. And I think this uh, anymore, because of the rise of divorce, this is pretty big. Um, if our parents split up, then we carry that fear um, that maybe our husband or wife will abandon us or the same thing will happen to us. A lot of times you, you may not even fully commit yourself to your marriage just in case things go wrong. And believe it or not, I've heard that out of the mouths um, of couples. Well, um, I just, I'm scared to fully put my trust in him or her. I'm scared to really dive in there because what if, what if things go wrong? Um, guess what? Marriage requires commitment, period. That's what it requires. Um, commitment is the foundation of trust. Without trust, we won't disclose more about ourselves, so we don't grow closer. Without trust, we don't take a long-term view and write out the lows of any marriage. Without trust, we won't invest in the future by making sacrifices on a regular basis. That's why commitment is on the outside, the, the rim of the marriage will. That's what holds all of that together that we've been talking about. Don't even say it. I have to know. You do see that's a, a wheel, like a tire <laughs> and a hub in the center and spokes going out. Just, just checking. That's all. It, anyway. A few weeks um, ago. No, go somebody. ahead. A few weeks ago, I had a blonde moment. We did the marriage course already a couple of times. Guess what? I go, That looks oh, like a tire. I didn't know that was a tire <laughs> and a wheel. <laughs> You're mean. So, some people come into marriage carrying unresolved pain and anger from their childhood, and this is affecting their marriage in a negative way. So now I get to read somebody else's story. Um, <laughs> this guy, Ted, his mother was a dynamic and forceful woman, and she had boundless energy, and this was channeled up into pushing her three children to achieve success in everything. She was driven by obsessive ambition, which she had not fulfilled in her own life. Ted's older brother excelled at sports, and his sister played two musical instruments, both to a high standard. And Ted was always expected to follow in their footsteps. You'll get, you'll get onto the first team, Ted, just like Robert, is what his mom would say, or um, I've organized two weeks of coaching for you over your vacation. And no, you can't go stay with your buddy Phil because I've booked you for a week of sailing so you can race next summer with Jane. Ted's life had been organized and planned for him since the moment he was born, and he was never allowed to disagree, nor permitted to express his own feelings. When Julia, later on in life, when Julia, his wife, suggested that they should go biking for the weekend, um, his cutting and hurtful reply was, why are you always trying to control my life? And this became a heated argument, and accusations flew backward and forward, and, and the issue of the biking weekend was forgotten over this exchange of fire, and uh, Ted had now perfected the art of finishing the exchange with a sarcastic comment that usually left his wife Julia in tears. Ted's resentment for his mother's attempt to control his life and his pent-up anger had remained all of these years, and it poured out, however not against his mother, but against his wife, and their confusion about the source of so much conflict in their marriage eventually caused them to seek help. Look, we know that tonight's going to produce different reactions from every single one of you. Some of you, you'll leave with increased gratitude. 
Um, others that will reveal different expectations that are the result of our upbringings that are causing the conflict that you have. Um, for others, it will really be distressing to recognize unresolved um, pain and buried anger that's left over from the past and to realize that they are affecting our marriage. So it's important to address issues about family background and our relationship with the extended family together so that we understand each other better. We need to be realistic about our view of our parents, um, if, whether they passed on or they're still living. An adult relationship requires that we accept our parents for who they were rather than who we would have liked for them to be. Uh, as you look back on your upbringing and the models that you inherited from your parents, you need to be objective about what their strengths and what their weaknesses were. Um, a young child's view typically is that their parents don't do anything wrong at all. Well, by the time that child becomes a young teen... Or eight or nine. Yeah. Their parents usually can't do anything right. Um, I like this quote from Mark Twain, <clears throat> myself. It says, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to be around the old man. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much that old man had learned in just seven years. <laughs> Our, our husband or our wife cannot, or if, let me start, if your, your husband or your wife has unmet childhood needs, you need to be aware of those. I mean, if you can try to understand those needs, then you start better understanding your spouse. When you can face those things together, it'll make you that much stronger. And uh, so we're going to go to do some exercises on that thought. First, you know, on page 67, there's a little exercise. Basically, you take that circle that says me, and then you add a circle for, um, you know, your mom, your sister, your dad, your brother, and basically, well, you can read through it, but if they're touching, then you had a, a relationship that was, you know, was, had some communication, and if they're overlapping, they're very close, and if they're separated, like in this one, the brother's clear on the other side of the father, that means there's a lack of relationship. Just, just look at your, your family, your mom, your dad, your siblings, and be realistic and show, okay, my mom, really, I didn't have anything going on with, or whatever it may be. And then uh, also on page 68 through 70, you have some questions there. And you look at, and just go through them, and on your first impulse, basically, check the relevant box. And after you filled out all those page, look at, give it to, trade it with your spouse, and look through it, and discuss what you're coming up there with there, and, and, and see what you can learn about each other through that. Also, de or dessert is ready, and been ready for a little bit, so please help yourself, and we'll be back to you in about half an hour. We just have a little bit. A little bit left for you, and then we'll let you go home. And just as a reminder, next week, Thanksgiving weekend, we won't be here. So we'll meet back on the 30th. All right, so now we're going to talk about healing childhood pain. As we look back to our upbringings, we all have different responses. For some of you, this last exercise that we just went through has caused you to look back with the gratitude, with the positive parenting. Um, Others, it's going to be really painful. It's been difficult. So if that's the case, there needs to be an ongoing process beyond tonight of um, supporting each other. Things take time to heal. Healing comes in layers. There's a need to talk things through. Being married itself is very healing. So now we want to look at four steps for addressing and resolving pain for, from childhood. Whether that is for yourself or your spouse, these steps will apply. Some of you may need more help um, beyond this session. Please remember that you can put it in the prayer box or you can talk to some of us personally, um, and we'd be glad to help and pray. No, I, I, this is turned off. I know it's on. Is this on? Okay. Hello? I just wanted to, you know, if you get to the point at any time that you want to talk to somebody, remember that, that this isn't something that we're going to share, anything that you want to sit down and visit with, or even if it's just in passing, that... These are private conversations. I just want to throw that in there. Okay. So the first step for addressing and resolving pain would be recognize unmet needs where our parents have failed us. This can be hard because our assumption as children was usually that our parents have, been, have had the right to treat us as they did. 
One woman who came to the marriage course talked of the abuse she suffered from her own father. As a teenager, her father beat her and ordered her to leave home. But when the leaders talked to her about it, her response was, there, there's just got to be something wrong with me. But really, there was nothing wrong with her. It can be hard to admit that our parents have failed us but we need to ask if there is buried hurt left over from our childhood, as this can easily come out as anger against others, and often the first victim is our husband or wife. Um, if you start to recognize buried pain, don't be surprised if strong feelings start to surface. The aim is to recognize this, these feelings in order to move through them. So after you've recognized these unmet needs, the next step would be to grieve with each other. Um, marriage is either going to compound the, the, the past the hurts from the past or that's going to help heal those hurts from the past. When someone is bereaved, when they've lost somebody, they must be allowed to talk. To talk is, is what brings about that healing. And, and sometimes the irrational emotions that go, through, go with bereavement are, are very similar to the emotions that go with those unmet childhood needs. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot my page turning. A woman whose parents were divorced when she was 12, and she had no relationship with her father from that point on. And, and she said that she'd never noticed the effect that she had on herself. She was always aware of the loss that her brother suffered, but when she was asked to talk about uh, with her husband about what she went through, it was, it was at that time that she realized the effect that, that growing up with divorced parents had created in her and with her intimacy with her, her spouse. If your husband or your wife has unmet childhood needs, that you need to make a point of showing them that support. You know, if it was a divorce like that, that, that lady had gone through, or whatever it may be, just be a, a place for her to, to be safe, or him to be safe there. You need to allow your spouse to talk about it, and, and give them that gift of that foundation with uh, that support. And remember, you know, Go back over and look at the communication things and where you, you know, what you are working on in your communication and put it to work right here. Mm -hmm. The Bible uh, in Romans 12:15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, but it also says to mourn with those who mourn. Uh, it, it means that if, if affection or affirmation was missing from your husband or wife's childhood, be sensitive to that. Uh, be there to mourn with them. And, and be ready when that healing comes to rejoice with them. And then there's forgiveness. It's an essential prerequisite for healing. Forgiveness involves giving up the desire to repay and giving up unrealistic expectations of our parents. As we learned last week from Lesson Teresa, forgiveness is an act of the will. We may not feel like it, but it's the only way to really, truly be step free. Um, remember Les telling the story of Corey Ten Boom. When she forgave, then the feelings followed. Um, if we have been deeply hurt, the forgiveness will need to be an ongoing process each time that pain surfaces. Um, as we do, the memories will be less and less and less, and they'll have less power on us. We have to forgive whether or not our parents have changed, and whether or not they recognize how they've hurt us. It's the only way for us to be set free. A lady who went to marriage course gave permission to re reproduce a letter that she wrote after attending this parent and in law session. I had a stepfather named John. My mother married him when I was seven and divorced him when I was 15. The application for divorce was made on the grounds of mental cruelty. My childhood was a nightmare. My biggest wish was to grow up as quickly as possible to get away from that situation. 